thanks a lot for coming to my talk. Um, my name is Jay Moda. I work for Credit Suisse in London. And uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, a project called Hippo and how we've been using Cassandra to solve some of the issues that, uh, that we've been running into. Um, I think before we get too uh, into the details of, uh, of Cassandra, it might be worth going through what, what Hippo is and the sort of context in which it, which it operates in. So what is Hippo? Hippo is, uh, at the core of it, it's a web service, and it exposes its API uh, using JSON over HTTP. And we have a number of clients uh, within uh, our risk system which connect to it. So we have the risk system itself, we have the trading UI, and the results store. So for those who maybe don't come from a financial uh, sort of trading background, the, the purpose of a risk system uh, is kind of twofold. One is to make sure that uh, traders can risk manage their portfolios. So what that essentially means is regardless of how the market moves, um, if they hedge their portfolios correctly, they shouldn't be losing any money. And there's also another function that a risk system provides, which is to uh, provide uh, results and reports for various control functions who monitor trading activity. So those are the two main things that a, that, you know, that a risk system does. And in terms of um, trader usage, intraday usage, uh, there are s certain events that happen when a trader wants to value a portfolio. So the first thing is they go out and they refresh their market data and they get brand new equity spot prices, FX spot prices, trades, everything that goes into valuing a portfolio. N the next thing that they do is once all this data uh, is, has been refreshed, it's saved into Hippo and at that point they make some decisions about what they want to do with this data. So they can decide to hold some of that data if they're not interested it in sort of uh, applying that to their new valuation. Or uh, they can even override some of that data if they're not happy with certain values. Next uh, is the concept of tagging. So once they've decided what data should go into their next valuation, they effectively tag that data. And uh, what that this, the, the concept of a tag is also stored in Hippo as well. And then finally, uh, they calculate the results and they view the results using the trading UI. Now, in terms of uh, Hippo's involvement in that, it's involved in the majority of those activities. So, um, you know, while the, the name might sound quite whimsical, it's, it's a very important uh, component within the risk management system, within uh, the equity derivatives risk management system. <coughs> uh, in terms of the technology stack, uh, all this data is stored in Cassandra. Uh, we recently upgraded to 1.2.16. Um, the, the Hippo processes themselves are Java, uh, Java applications and they run across multiple VMs. And uh, we expose our HTTP endpoints using Jetty. Uh, a lot of the data that Hippo stores is immutable in nature. So once it's stored in Hippo, it's never updated again. So that makes it a prime candidate for, for caching. And we, we configure Squid in a reverse proxy mode and we place it in front of all of our, our sort of get uh, APIs to, to sort of offload some of the read pressure uh, from Cassandra. And um, we use HAProxy to load balance all of our client requests uh, across the various Hippo nodes. Uh, we, certain sort of requests that we get are quite uh, time consuming and uh, we want to throttle some of them. So we, we use Hazelcast's uh, distributed queue functionality to, to offload some of that work. And um, in terms of uh, monitoring, we're heavy users of Graphite we uh, try and throw as many metrics as we can to Graphite in terms of uh, sort of OS level metrics, app level metrics, and Cassandra metrics as well. And finally, we use uh, Kibana and Logstash to be able to sort of uh, 
do searching across all of our log files, which are on a number of machines. So that's the uh, technology stack. Uh, in terms of uh, team size, uh, historically, there's only been four of us working on this project. Uh, we've recently increased that to five. Uh, but the team also is responsible for a number of other applications within the sort of risk management space as well. So at any given point in time, there'd be a maximum of maybe two people working on the project actively and supporting it as well. So functionally speaking, there are two things that Hippo does. If you recall from the, one of the previous slides, we, it, one of the first things that a trader does is they will uh, refresh their market data. And the, the, uh, the, the result of refreshing their market data means that they need to store that somewhere. And that process of storing that data we call gallerification. So here's, uh, here's an example of what that data will look like. As you can tell, it's, uh, it's, it's JSON data. And um, this will typically be posted into Hippo from the risk management system, and it's telling Hippo to, to store this data. Now, behind the scenes, what Hippo does is, uh, first of all, if, it, if it's never seen, um, in this case, we're looking at, a, a, at an example of the Apple stock price. If it's never seen the Apple stock price, it will save it into Cassandra and return back uh, a reference to it, uh, effectively a path to the data. Uh, if it has seen the Apple stock price before, it will only save it if the stock price is different. Or, or, or any other, effectively, if that, if, if, if that JSON blob of data is different to what it already has, it will save it. So that's an example of uh, gallerification. And during, like a, during a typical uh, sort of refresh of market data, we're talking anywhere in the region of you know, 100 to 200,000 bits of market data that's getting saved into Hippo. <coughs> the next bit is this concept of tagging. So a tag is, a, is an important sort of a concept within Hippo because it represents essentially everything that is required by the analytics to value that portfolio. So over here, we're looking at a very, uh, a very simple example where we're seeing um, t two elements in the tag. And you can view a tag as, as a map where the key is an identifier that means something to the risk management system and the, the value is a path to where they can get it from Hippo. Um, so every valuation has a tag. And typically, uh, a tag consists of anywhere in the region of uh, 150,000 to 200,000 elements in there, depending on how, how many trades there are in the portfolio and how much market data the trades depend on. So hopefully you have a sort of rough idea of what Hippo is and what functionally what it's, what it's responsible for. So now I'd like to talk about uh, some of the challenges that we faced. Um, first of all, I'll just go through the challenges at, at, a, at a high level, and then we'll sort of dig a little bit deeper into them. So the first one is high availability. Um, how do we solve that, the issue of high, high availability, especially within the environment that we work in, which can be throw up some sort of unique curveballs um, compared to sort of other, other companies? And I'll go into a bit more detail in a bit. The next is of data retention. Um, we have uh, specific requirements, regulatory requirements, which mean that uh, certain types of data need to be stored for longer than other types of data. The next is scale. Um, the, the sort of the, the background to Hippo is um, it's part of the, the next generation risk management system for equity derivatives. What that means is uh, even to date, there's a constant barrage of, of existing portfolios from older risk management systems getting migrated over to, uh, over to this, the new risk management system. So we had to deal with scale in terms of making sure that when you add a new portfolio, it's not going to slow all the other portfolios down. And also from a cost perspective, you know, you're, you're not always going to have to add you know, uh, new, new Cassandra nodes to support a new portfolio. And then finally, um, improving the user experience. Um, this is quite an interesting one. I mean, 
you know, Hippo, we have this store of a lot of market data. How can we use all of that market data to sort of uh, improve uh, the sort of the working lives of our, of our traders and some of the, the common issues that they, that they come across? So first of all, how can we make Hippo available all the time? How do we solve the, uh, the high availability problem? I guess maybe another question to ask is why, why do we need to solve it? Because you know, previous risk systems, they didn't really solve it in a, in, a, in a good enough way, let's put it that way. Um, I guess one of the issues is uh, post-2008, post, uh, uh, the, the requirements that we have in terms of the number of uh, reports we need to run uh, has, has greatly, uh, greatly increased. So what that means is we really can't afford any downtime um, because the system's in use 24-7. It's used you know, throughout the week, day, and on the weekend as well. Um, also, from a, from a user perspective, our, our traders are, are now sort of that they expect systems to be online all the time. I guess, you know, they're, they're used to using, you know, uh, Gmail, Google, you know, services on the internet that are always online. And, and there's an expectation that, well, if they're going to ask the IT team to deliver a solution, that should, you know, fall under the same sort of category as well. It should be available all the time. And also from, a, from an engineering perspective, you know, we all take pride in, in what we do and what we work on. So we wanted to make sure that we nailed this problem, you know, in, in version one. So within the environment we work in, we have two types of downtime. There's, the, there's unplanned downtime, which is, I guess, not too dissimilar to any other, any other company out there. So it can be in, in the form of like a network partition, uh, a hardware failure, and, you know, it, it happens, and it sort of it happens more often than you would think. The other type of downtime that we face is planned downtime, and we have a qu quite a lot of planned downtime. Uh, that can be in the in the form of uh, we have things like quarterly maintenance windows, which which allow our infrastructure teams to take down a specific data center completely and uh, apply some sort of fixes on there or, or improve some of the hardware that's that's within that data center. We also have uh, simulated DR tests, which um, if, if your application is deemed as critical to, to, to the bank, then it has to pass these DR tests. And there's also things like, um, you know, when we upgrade Cassandra, when we, uh, I don't know, when we upgrade the VMs that it's running on, uh, that also is sort of classified as a as planned downtime. So during this planned downtime, we were, the option of taking down Hippo was not something that we wanted to really consider. We wanted the, the service to be available all the time. So how did we achieve that? Well, this is a, a typical topology of how Hippo is deployed within a specific region. So um, if we go from left to right, all client requests will hit our HA proxy and they'll be forwarded to a specific Hippo VM and um, what's interesting here is you'll see that our Cassandra clusters are, we, we've got a multi-data center set up. Um, but we, all of our Hippo VMs, which are split across two data centers, will only ever read or write to the, the active data center at any given point in time. Um, we, can, we, can, we can get away with this because even though they're geographically separate data centers, they're quite close to each other. So network latency of, uh, of a Hippo VM in DC2 talking to a Cassandra cluster in DC1 wasn't a massive issue for us. So that's, you know, that's, uh, that's high availability. But can we make it better? Well, you know, out of the box, obviously Cassandra provides a fantastic solution in terms of data replication. There's no, you know, there's no single master and, you know, all that good stuff. But there is an issue for us in making it better because uh, whenever, uh, whenever a data center, a Cassandra data center goes down, uh, in order to recover from that, we need to make sure that our Hippo VMs start talking to the, the, other, the, the passive data center. Now, um, one way we could have done that is obviously we can you know, log on to the production bo boxes, you know, push out a config change, do a rolling restart, 
and you know in theory you know that functionally that would work but the problem with that is the amount of downtime that that would potentially introduce to sort of intraday trading activities you know so you're the first person to identify this sort of problem would generally be our traders and um, you know the traders would then tell our first line support you know by which time we might you know, five minutes might have spent you know sort of uh, elapsed during that time the first line support would have a look around to see you know what if they can detect what's gone wrong so let's say they spend about 10 minutes trying to find out what's gone wrong and then after 10 minutes they figure out ah oh, it's you know we, we've lost some uh, some Cassandra nodes at which point they would have to get uh, sort of the developers involved. So you know, you, you're talking anywhere in the region of like 15 to to 20 minutes at a best effort to to the point where we can actually log on to the production boxes and apply a config change. Uh, the other thing to keep in mind is, you know, we're a small team and we're supporting a global deployment of Hippo. So we have deployments in EMEA, APAC, and the US as well. So if this was to happen in EMEA, Best case scenario, then that's fine because we're all based in London. Uh, if it was to happen in any, in any of the other regions, then you're you're adding to that, you know, additional downtime. You know, if they can't get hold of us or or whatever. So can we make it better? Yes, we can. So what we did was we made automatic DC switching uh, a feature of the application. Now I would just like to point out at this stage we're we're still on Hector and sort of um, uh, we. I think one of some of the new uh, the new data stacks drivers have some of the, these features built into it. But uh, when when we were initially creating Hippo, which was you know back in 2011, we, that you know the only way we could do this was to um, implement a, a custom Hector plugin. So this this custom Hector plugin is is aware. It, it knows about the the multi data center topology. Um, it knows about the replication factor and um, it can detect nodes going down. So how does this normally work? So here's, you know, here's uh, uh, an example where everything is, is looking good. Um, then we get a node that's, that's gone down in our active DC. Everything's still fine because we run with a replication factor of three and um, we can still continue using the active DC because there are enough replicas available to satisfy all reads and writes. So now we have two nodes going down. And at this point, we can no longer continue using the active DC. So at this point, the, uh, the, the Hector plugin that we've developed uh, detects this, this scenario, and it will start uh, flipping all the, uh, all the requests over to our passive DC, which is now the active DC. Uh, so, you know, we're talking, you know, there'll, there'll, there'll be a slight blip but we're talking seconds as opposed to tens of minutes. Um, so that's how we, that's how we solve the unplanned downtime issue. But can we make it better still? We still have the issue of planned downtime where we know, for example, next weekend uh, DC2 is gonna be taken offline. So rather than waiting for that to happen, let's just flip over to DC1 on a Friday so that you know there aren't any nasty surprises during the weekend. Um, so that's what we did. We we made on-demand DC switching a feature of the of the application, and the way we did that was we exposed. This is a this is like our our status page. Um, on the on the far right hand side, you'll see uh, our DC switch. So right now, all of our Hippo nodes. So each each sort of row in this status page represents a hippo node. They're all talking to DC2. Um, so if we wanted to flip that over to DC1, so the, the user would go in, or well, you know, a support user, for example, and they'd uh, make sure that they have permissions to do this, they'd click on the DC1 button, and then you know, behind the scenes, all of our nodes are now talking to DC1. I guess you guys might be wondering, well, we sort of over-engineered this solution a little bit. Well, actually, if you look at this graph, this, what this graph represents is every time we have a read or a write, we, we stat within Graphite which DC it's hit. Uh, and, and the different bandings represent a change in DC, so effectively a flip in DC. Uh, and and the, the time scale is in the last three months. So in the last three months, we've 
we've had to flip DCs six times in order to maintain continuous availability. So you know, it's it's not a it's not an uncommon uh, uh, feature or uncommon task that we have to do. And pretty much, predominantly, all of this is down to planned downtime. None of it's none of it's unplanned downtime. The black stripes. The black. <laughs> Good point. Uh, the black stripes is when we had a complete uh, shutdown of both DCs because of a, of a complete blackout window. Yeah. So the next thing, uh, the next challenge that we had to face was that of sort of retention and how we can save disk space. So it turns out, you know, a lot of the data that Hippo stores is is quite ephemeral in nature. Uh, if you think about uh, trading. Uh, doing uh, intraday valuations, they, uh, once they look at an intraday valuation, they might refer to it once or twice, but they're never really going to refer to it again because the market's moved on, they need to do another valuation. So we have this, we have a concept of, of, of sh short-term data, um, which we need to store for, a, for a, a short amount of time, but then afterwards, you know, nobody really looks at that data anymore. And, and the vast majority of our overnight uh, valuations, which, which form the, the, the bulk of, of the work that Hippo does, uh, falls into the short-term data bucket. We also have long-term data as well. Now, you know, a, a, a trader might do, you know, 200-odd intraday valuations. Um, out of those 200 intraday valuations, one or two will be special valuations. And they're, they're special because they, the, the data, the, the results that are generated from those runs, they're sent to sort of the accounting uh, processes and all that sort of stuff. So it's, it's, it's data that we want to keep around for, for longer. And that, that the, the, the period is also sort of uh, governed by some regulatory um, uh, sort of uh, demands as well. So it can, it can be anywhere between three months to seven years that we want to keep some of this long-term data for. The, the tricky thing about long-term data is you don't know it's long-term at the point of inserting that data into Cassandra because uh, the trader can, can do a valuation and then he'll, he'll review his valuation and say, yep, that, that valuation is important to me. I'm happy for the results from that valuation to be sent downstream. So that, that element of, uh, of long-term data sort of introduced uh, some complexity in how we solve this problem. So what, what, what options do we have? Well, Hippo could delete the data. We could uh, create a process which triggers every, every day and looks at last day's worth of uh, data. And then it would sort of uh, you know, go in and delete the data from Cassandra. Um, yeah, and you know, that, that's one possibility. But you know, we weren't really that happy with this solution because A, I guess the obvious problem with this is performance. While this process is busy deleting data, the risk management system is busy trying to save data. So not, not ideal. Also, the, the amount of complexity that this would introduce uh, was not something that we were happy with because we had to deal with things like failure scenarios. Uh, wh what do you do if you miss a, miss a gap in the data? How do, you, you know, how do you know that you've missed a gap in the data? So we weren't really that, um, that happy with this solution. So then we thought, well, maybe Cassandra could delete the data. If we told Cassandra, you know, this data should only be kept for a certain amount of time, uh, then Cassandra could delete it away for us. And it turns out, you know, you might be already aware that Cassandra has this TTL feature. So that's what we do. We, every, any bit of data that gets inserted into Cassandra has a default TTL period. And that period is, I think, somewhere around like five or six days. So after six days, uh, the data will appear deleted to anybody who's trying to query that data back out of Hippo again. Uh, and obviously behind the scenes, Cassandra will compact away that data and ultimately free up the disk space for us. Now, for our longer term data, what we do is we, we expose the functionality to our clients to allow them to say after the fact, they can say, well, actually, you know, this tag that I created, that's important to me. Please, can you keep it around for a given period? And that request, uh, because it, it has to go through, you know, hundreds of thousands of elements within the tag, uh, we sort of throttle that request by putting it onto a, uh, a background queue, which we use um, Hazelcast for. 
So effectively, what we do is that that it, uh, that process we, we call that process immortalization. So we immortalize a tag and all the data that's referenced by a tag. And all we're doing during that process is uh, we're effectively rewriting that data back into Cassandra with a different TTL. And this works for us because a, a very small portion of our of our of our data falls into this category. So that's that's data retention. So now, you know, we've fixed high availability, we've fixed uh, our data retention problems. The next issue we had was tag creation. As more and more portfolios were getting onboarded onto, the, onto our new risk management system, the time taken to create a, uh, a tag was, was, uh, was causing issues in terms of the overall time to value a, value a portfolio. So this, this timeline resembles you know, the main activities that, we ha that happen. So to gallerify all, all, the, all the new data took around about 50 seconds. To create a tag took 150 seconds. And to value a, a portfolio took 300 seconds. So generally speaking, around about 500 seconds, depending on the portfolio. It's just, these are just sort of rough numbers. But 30% of that time generally was taken up creating a tag. So why was tag creation so slow? Well. One of the reasons behind that it was it was quite a chatty interface. If a tag had a had a had a hundred thousand elements in there, it would equate to a hundred thousand calls into Hippo from from our risk management system. Um, in addition to the time taken to create a tag, the amount of disk space used to con to to save a tag was sort of growing at an exponential rate. And the reason for that is kind of how we were modeling this in Cassandra. Um, even though a tag, if you if you consider a valuation that's done at 10 o'clock and a valuation that's done at, 10, at 5 past 10, the amount of data that's changed between those two valuations is going to be minimal. You might have some spot prices that, that change, FX rates that change, but your trade representations aren't going to change. The vast majority of that data isn't going to change. But the way we were storing it in Cassandra meant that every single tag was a brand new bit of data in Cassandra. Uh, when we compared that to our gallery data, there was a large overlap in that data. Uh, and that makes sense, right? Because we only store gallery data if it's changed, and a lot of gallery data is shared across different portfolios. So what we wanted to do was we wanted to get our tag sort of uh, modeling to resemble this sort of overlap in data to, to save space in, in Cassandra. I mean, you know, you could argue that we could just add more, more nodes to, to Cassandra. But, uh, you know, post-2008, IT costs are a, are, a, are a significant sort of proportion to, to um, you know, what, what the money the business makes. So there's a, very, uh, there's a very strong emphasis on TCO. So that wasn't an option that was available to us. So what we thought is it would be nice to create a tag that's based on an existing tag. Um, and what that would allow us to do is we can say, well, you know, only, only, a, only a small portion of data has changed when I compare it to my previous tag, I'll just tell you what data that's changed. And by the way, here's the base tag that you should create this new tag from. So if we have a look at this, uh, the, the tag column family, this is how we used to store tags. So the, the partition key is a tag ID, and then each column represents an element in the tag. So this is quite a wide row as well. So you'd have around about you know, 200,000 odd uh, columns for this row. And every time you add a new tag, it meant a, new, a brand new row. Even when the you know, majority of the data that it's referencing within each column value is the same. So in here, you can see only the, the GBP USD spot price has changed between the two tags, but it's still, uh, everything else is still the same. So what we did was we refactored our, our sort of Cassandra storage to resemble something like this. So we introduced this concept of a taglet, and a taglet represents grouping of, of market data. So in this case, we have three taglets. So we have an equity spot price, FX spot, FX spot rate, and a trade taglet. And uh, that would, that would, in this example, they only have a couple of elements in there, but in a real example, you'd see you know, thousands, uh, tens of thousands of elements of, uh, associated to each taglet. Uh, and then what we do is we reference the taglet to the tag. So for instance, the equity spot price for that tag referenced the equity spot price taglet. The same for the FX spot rate, and the same for the trade as well. So now we can do something like this, right? We can create a delta tag. We can say to Hippo, you know, I want a, a new tag which looks like tag one, two, three, but with a different FX spot rate for GBP USD. So how do we do this? Well, first of all, 
we'd add a new row to the tag column family. And it references the same tag list that, the, that tag123 references. Next, we add a new taglet. So this new taglet represents the, the same, effectively the same FX spot rate as FX spot rate 123, but uh, it has a new version for GBPUSD. And finally, we need to associate that taglet to our new tag. So we add a new, uh, add a new entry there. So what this meant in terms of the actual time to value of portfolio was, you know, Gallerify is still the same because we haven't changed that. Tag creation has gone down to five seconds, and obviously calculations still stay the same. So there was a significant um, increase in the, uh, the amount of, uh, or rather decrease, sorry, in the amount of time to, to value a portfolio. And, you know, created, creating tags became very cheap as well. And in terms of the data, now that we're sharing uh, a, a vast bulk of the data, um, the actual overlap in data was a lot more. So we were saving a lot of disk space as well. So finally, um, one of the, you know, I've, I've worked on a, a number of risk management systems in the front office space, and you'd get this sort of question asked you quite regularly from a trader. He'd call you up, and he'll tell you, you know, my valuations have been going fine all day long. All of a sudden, you know, my delta's gone completely, you know, it's been flat all day long, and now it's gone completely wrong. Why is that? That's a difficult question to, to answer if you're not a trader. I guess ultimately what he's, what he's really asking for is what bit of market data has changed between my good valuation and my bad valuation. So what we thought is, well, you know, we, we have all that data. Hippo has all the data that went into those two valuations. It'd be great if we could uh, answer that question using the Hippo data. So ultimately what we were talking about was what's the best approach to diffing two arbitrary tags? So one approach would be like the, we can just traverse the, the tag. So we'd have a look at two tags, we'd have a look at uh, all the taglets that those two tags um, uh, refer to, and then we'd have a look at all the gallery data that the taglets refer to. And in this example, you probably can't see it too well, but the, the only difference in this is the, the very, the, the leaf node on the right-hand side. But in order to come to that answer, we have to go to every single element in that tag. So while functionally it would work, uh, it would be expensive to do, and we already know that all the data doesn't change all the time when we're creating tags, so it's sort of, you know, it's wasteful to, to do it this way as well. A better approach would be if we, you can't really, those are sort of the lighter shades of circles there, but anyways, a better approach would be comparing hashes. So if we stored hashes at each level, we would only need to compare the hash. And if the, if, the, if the hash of the two tags are the same, then we wouldn't have to go any further. We can, we can say that those two tags and the data that they reference is, is the same. But in this example, let's just say that the, you know, the, 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 the same leaf node is different. You only have to do a very minimal number of comparisons. And we actually we were inspired by this idea from how Cassandra does its uh, sort of anti-entropy read repair, or rather the repair process. So, you know, where do we calculate the hashes? We need, a, we need a point where we can do that. So we gallerify the data, we create the tag, and then we close the tag. And now at this point, when we close the tag is when we go and create these, these hash of hashes. And it's quite a cheap operation because keep in mind, we're only doing this for the taglets that have changed. And, you know, we already know that not everything changes within the tag all the time. So it's a, it's a I mean, a worst case scenario, you have to do it to create the hashes for everything, but generally speaking, it's only for you know a small proportion of that data. Then we calculate it, and then now we can we can diff the two tags to see what's changed. So we modeled this. Uh, it turns out the the refactoring we did for delta tags made it very easy because we we store the hashes at each level here. It's like a, almost like a static column that we store against each each row. And for example, the hash of the tag is a hash. Is a, is a hash that's composed of the two taglets. Likewise for this one. And the taglet hash is composed of the gallery hash as well. And so on. So uh, lessons learned. Um, hurry up a little bit. Um, generally speaking, you know, we've been blown away by Cassandra. We were very, very early adopters. I think we started 0 0.8 back on Windows, back in the bad old days. 
but you know, generally speaking, it's been it's been a great uh, a great solution f in solving our challenges. But in terms of lessons learned, find a senior advocate. Um, the environment that we work in can be quite um, quite conservative when it comes to adopting new technologies, and having somebody senior who can uh, who can really uh, sell this this technology to upper management has been really beneficial for us. Try and measure everything. You know, we, like I said, we heavy users of graphite. We, whenever we have an issue, it's generally not one metric that we can rely on to try and de deduce what the problem is. So the more metrics that you have, the better chance you have of coming to a to an answer. Um, you know, obviously take time to understand Cassandra. You know, CQL has made it very easy, but it's good to understand the underlying data model as well. And try and UAT everything. Um, we, you know, we try and keep our UAT environments looking very similar to production. Uh, when it comes to upgrading and all that sort of stuff, it's made it very, very easy for us. Uh, the future of Cassandra? Well, there's continued investment in Hippo. The business clearly see the benefit of it, and we're moving over to Cassandra 2.0 and uh, on physical machines as well. Uh, there's an increased adoption. Uh, we have teams in, in Hong Kong who are uh, using Cassandra for some of their solutions as well. And we like data stacks. You know, we, up until now, we've only been using the Apache Cassandra uh, deployment of, of, of Cassandra. We haven't really required uh, data stacks as help, but more recently, we're, we're using uh, some of the solar and we're uh, solar technologies, and also we're looking into the Spark integration as well. So that's, uh, that's Hippo.